thank you everybody for coming tonight. Uh, tonight we are having the Saul Feinstone lecture on the meaning of freedom. Gratz is proud to reintroduce this annual lecture for the first time in three decades. Our distinguished lecturer tonight, the Honorable Elizabeth Holtzman, is in the company of incredibly impressive individuals who have given the Saul Feinstone lecture in the past. These include former US Representative William H. Gray III, uh, who spoke in 1991, US Senator from New Jersey, Frank Lautenberg, who spoke in 1985, and perhaps most importantly at all, of all, a very young, brand new US Senator from Delaware in 1982, named Joe Biden spoke here on Israeli democracy and American interest in the Middle East. Saul Feinstone, who endowed this lecture, was a Lithuanian-born Jewish immigrant, a distinguished collector of early American documents and manuscripts, and he is the benefactor of many institutions, including Gratz College, the Jewish Theological Seminary, Temple University, and West Point. He held dearly the idea of freedom and liberty because, of course, as an immigrant to the United States, he experienced liberty firsthand, having come from Eastern Europe. It is now my honor and my great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Elizabeth Holtzman. In the summer of 1974, while I was working on my PhD, I spent much of the summer watching the House Judiciary Committee debate Richard Nixon and Watergate. I watched Elizabeth Holtzman, then a first term member of Congress from New York, articulately ask questions, make very, very sharp and smart comments, and ultimately vote yes on the impeachment of Richard Nixon. Later, we could see her questioning President Gerald Ford after he pardoned Richard Nixon. Elizabeth Holtzman at the time was the youngest woman to ever serve in Congress. Uh, she was 32 years old when she was elected to Congress in, uh, or when she took her seat in Congress in uh, 1973. She served until 1981, and then she transformed herself into the district attorney of Kings County, Brooklyn, becoming the first elected district attorney who was a woman in the history of New York City. Uh, she argued successfully before the Supreme Court, pioneered new strategies on sexual assault, and later served as the Comptroller of New York City, managing a $50 billion uh, endowment of the city's five pension funds. Uh, while she was in Congress, Elizabeth Holtzman authored a bill to create the Office of Special Investigation in the Justice Department to investigate Nazis who had come to the United States illegally by lying about their activities during the war, about lying about their war crimes, their crimes against humanities, humanity, and snuck into the United States. There were many of them. And Representative Holtzman had enough of this. She exposed this to the American people. She got Congress to pass a law creating this special office. And the special office then began to prosecute and kick out people who had come in here illegally. These people were not prosecuted for their crimes. That was something that had to be done in the places where they committed their crimes. But they could be prosecuted by the United States and have their citizenship taken away and be forced to leave the country because they had lied about their war crimes. And that is the subject of her talk tonight. Um, Elizabeth Holtzman continues to be active in law. She works in the government relations department at the Herrick Law Firm in New York City. She has served as a special um, aide to the Secretary of Defense uh, in looking at the response to adult sexual crimes uh, in the military. And she served in the Clinton administration as an advisor uh, dealing with records of war crimes by both the Nazis and the Japanese. Uh, I am thrilled to have her here because I have to say, when I was 
studying for my graduate degree, it was someone like her. It was her, in fact, watching her on the television, watching her in action that spurred me to my career where I have focused most of my life on issues of human rights and social justice. And so it is my great honor and my great delight to introduce Representative Elizabeth Holtzman. Liz, the show is now yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for your very kind introduction. Thanks to the college too for this invitation and thanks to the, endow the person who's endowed this um, lecture tonight. Um, I'm very grateful and I'm very grateful to stand in such good company um, in giving this lecture. Uh, the story I'm going to tell is a story about evil and how to deal with it. It's a very sordid chapter in our country's history. I hope that uh, state legislators are not going to try to excise discussion of this in high schools or colleges. But uh, this is a story that was born in secrecy and uh, luckily is now seen the light of day and perhaps we can learn from it. And it's a story about how Nazi war criminals came to this country, in some cases perfectly legally, in some cases they were brought here by the US government, and in some cases they lied to come here. Uh, how that happened, who they were, and what we did to remove them from the country is a very important story. And it starts, not surprisingly, with a whistleblower, a man who was connected with the immigration service I was in Congress, this was my very first term in Congress, so I was just as new as you could be. And he came to see me in my Washington office and he said to me, you know, the US government has a list of Nazi war criminals living in the United States and is doing nothing about it. And I looked at him and he was respectably dressed, he looked normal, he didn't mention laser beams. I said, but this story doesn't make sense to myself. It can't be. How could it be that the US government would allow Nazis to be in this country? We fought Hitler in World War II. Tens of thousands of Americans died fighting Hitler. Why would we want his henchmen living here among us? What message does that send to the world? But I, I couldn't really believe that it was a true story. And on the other hand, I couldn't forget about it. So the next time that the immigration commissioner came before the subcommittee I was on, which happened to be the immigration subcommittee, it came my turn to ask a question. And I asked, I said, is it true that the immigration service has a list of Nazi war criminals living in the United States? And he said, yes, I almost fell off my chair because it's in general fact that most government officials don't like to admit uncomfortable facts. Oh yes, we have the list. And my next question was, well, what are you doing about this list? And then I just got a cloud of words and obfuscation and cover up actually. So I said, you know something, I want to see the files. I had no idea whether I had any right to see the files, but I demanded the files on these Nazi war criminals. And they were placed uh, in a room in New York in the immigration offices in New York. And uh, I went to look at them. And I'll never forget this. It was a bare table uh, and there was a stack of files. I didn't have to go through too many of the files it turned out because they were all exactly the same. What was the same about them? Well, you know, I opened the first file. I don't remember what name it was, but it was an allegation that Mr. X had been the head of a police unit that killed Jews in Lithuania. And then it said, uh, we went to visit Mr. X and we asked him how he was feeling. And he said he was fine. And so we left. So that was case number one. I went to case number two. I said, why are they asking about his health? What's going on here? Why are they asking about the allegations? Case number two, a government official in Ukraine involved in, again, in seizing Jews property or ghettoizing them or sending them to ditches and to where they could be shot. And the same thing happens. Immigration official comes, knocks on the door, 
person answers the door, are you so-and-so? Yes. How are you feeling? The person says, I feel fine. Thank you very much. Bye. Well, I went through about three, four, five files like this, and they were all exactly the same. It was totally apparent. I didn't have to go any farther. The immigration service was totally uninterested in finding out whether these allegations were true. It was not a public health service, last I looked, but it was not investigating them. I put my thoughts together, and shortly thereafter, I held a press conference in which I accused the United States government of creating a sanctuary for Nazi war criminals, doing nothing about it, of desecrating the memory of those who died fighting Hitler, desecrating the memory of the millions of victims, six million Jews, hundreds of thousands of Roma and, and others. And then of course the millions who were engulfed in this horrific war that he started. It's a desecration of the values of the United States to give sanctuary here to people who engaged, not just in one murder, mass murder. These weren't would-be Nazis, neo-Nazis. They were the real McCoy and their hands had blood on them. Well, it didn't happen overnight. It took four more years of slogging through this problem, but we finally got it turned around and we finally made a difference. But I'm gonna tell you a little bit about who these people were who came here because it's very vague, a Nazi war criminal. What is a Nazi war criminal? What exactly did they do? So the first person I'd like to mention, one of the highest officials who came here was a man called Andrea Artikovich. Artikovich was actually the interior minister of Croatia, which was a Nazi puppet state in Yugoslavia. The interior minister is in charge of the police functions, the state security and so forth. And he was responsible for sending tens of thousands of Jews, Serbs and gypsies to their deaths. He signed the orders, no question about it. He came here, he wasn't sent back to Yugoslavia and he was allowed to remain here. This was number one person. So we're talking about somebody who is responsible for the death mass murder of tens of thousands of people. Then you have a man called Arthur Rudolph. Well, who is Arthur Rudolph? Arthur Rudolph was the number two person he was a camp administrator, maybe he was also an engineer, at a camp called Dora um, that the Nazis had set up. This was a slave labor camp, mostly for prisoners of war, French, Russians, Czechs, Poles. Um, it wasn't a concentration camp for Jews, although there were a few Jews, but not many who were there. And these people were worked to death what were they doing? They were building missiles to be launched at Britain at the, you know, they hadn't achieved the ability to send to the United States, but these were missiles that were being built there. And people, 28,000 prisoners of war were worked to death at that camp. This man, who was the number two administrator in that camp, came to the United States, and then he was put in charge of a portion of our space program. Okay, that's another person. Then we have someone called Bishop Trifa, Bishop Valerian Trifa. Bishop Trifa uh, was a leader in the Student Iron Guard, which was a fascist movement in Romania, where he helped to lead a pogrom against Jews. Thousands of Jews were killed in this pogrom. And it was so vicious that they actually hung Jews from meat hooks, bodies of Jews, and stamped them kosher. Bishop Treva came to the United States. He became the head of the Roma Romanian Orthodox Church. He was invited by Richard Nixon to give the opening prayer at the US Senate. And uh, he was a commentator from time to time on Radio Free Europe, which I objected to enormously. So this was another person. And we have someone called Carl Linus. Well, Carl Linus was 
an Estonian. And he was involved, he was a high camp administrator of a concentration camp in Estonia, where thousands of Jews were killed. We're talking about people who are mass murderers, thousands of people killed. Um, and he actually also, the evidence showed, shot Jews personally to death. Um, there's an interesting case about um, Linus, which we could get into in some depth in question period. I don't know if I have time to go into it. But basically, the US government didn't want to deport him to uh, Estonia. Uh, so they were going to send him to uh, live out his life, even though the Justice Department had removed his citizenship and got a deportation order against him because of his Nazi war crimes, because of his participation in the murder and persecution of thousands of people, US government was going to send him to Panama to live out his life in peace and under some palm trees and sunshine and enjoy his retirement. Well, I was able to foil that, but that's what our government was going to do. And then you have a man called Lilakis, Alexandrus Lilakis from Lithuania. He was head of the security police in Vilnius Vilnius was known in Jewish culture, cultural history as Vilna. It was a great, great, great center, center of Jewish learning. Anyway, he was the chief of police there and deeply involved in the deportation and destruction of the entire Jewish community in Vilna. He um, came to the United States. He was actually allowed to come here and support it. He, he worked for the CIA in Europe. I don't know what his expertise was, except in killing Jews. Uh, but he worked for the CIA and then came to the United States where he was supported by them. Finally, he was deported um, back to Lithuania. Uh, another person is um, John um, Demjanjuk. His name is pretty well known in the United States because the government brought a number of proceedings against him. But he was a concentration camp guard at a place called Sobibor. Unlike Auschwitz, Sobibor was a place just for extermination. There was no slave labor camp there. Almost nobody who went there survived. It, people went directly from the trains to the gas chambers. He was a concentration camp guard there. There were also concentration camp guards from, con from concentration camps all over Europe, Treblinka, Majdanek, and the rest. Um, you had the, the people who came here were mayors of small towns, chiefs of police, members of, of uh, the collaborationist armies, uh, people in the Waffen SS, which was uh, actually a military unit under the control of the SS, which uh, was itself uh, named uh, an outlaw organization at the Nuremberg trials. So this is kind of gives you a feeling for who was here. And the horror of it was that they, it wasn't just one or two. Some estimates were, we don't know the total number of people who came here. We know some estimates are that as many as 10,000 Nazi war criminals came here. The US government was able finally, after the work that I did, to bring cases against about 100 Nazi war criminals. And how did that come about finally? After this, I'm gonna go back now to this, the whistleblower came to me and, I'm going, and, and then I stood up and said, the government has to change its approach to these cases. But I was just a brand new member of Congress. I couldn't make anybody do anything. But as I acquired seniority, I was able to do two really critical things. And the president mentioned them. One was, to pass a law, it's now called the Holtzman Amendment, that um, plugged up some loopholes in the existing law on people who came to this country. This, my law said that anybody who ever engaged in persecution under the Nazis on account of race, religion, national origin could be deported from the United States. The citizenship could be removed and they could be deported. That meant that all these Nazi war criminals, whether they lied or they didn't lie, could be deported. 
the second, and it was retroactive. The second thing that I did was to force the government to create a special unit to deal with these, to track down the Nazi war criminals and to bring them to justice. By the way, we couldn't prosecute these cases here because of the ex post facto law we have. Since they didn't commit the crime here and it wasn't a crime to commit Nazi war crimes abroad, we couldn't prosecute them here, but we could bring them to justice. We would remove their citizenship if they had it. We would deport them to countries that would take them where they could be brought to justice. And uh, it was, wasn't easy because the government was not willing to do this. Uh, our government opposed it. They said to me, no, Liz, we're not going to create a Nazi war crimes unit in the Department of Justice, not at all. And I knew how crucial it was because these cases are, were even at that time, this was 1970, in, in the late 70s, these cases are more than a quarter of a century old. Old cases, very difficult to bring to justice. First of all, the witnesses lose their memories. Secondly, documents get lost. You can't amass the evidence, very hard. It's even harder, of course, because the Nazis tried to destroy not only the witnesses and not only the victims, but the documents as well. So you needed to have people who had a single mission, and that was to bring the Nazi war criminals to justice. And the Justice Department said, no, we're not going to do it. And by that time, I was chair of the immigration subcommittee, slowly, slowly made my way up in the ranks of Congress. And so I said to the Department of Justice, I said, you know something, we can do it two ways. Either you can create the unit voluntarily, or I'm going to write it into law. And uh, the Department of Justice thought about it and they said, we'll do it on our own. And they did. They created a unit. They staffed it with professionals. They staffed it with historians. They staffed it with people who knew what they were doing. And they started a worldwide search for documents, including documents in the Soviet Union, including Israel, including Germany. There was nowhere that they didn't reach out to find the facts. A huge job. And that's why you needed historians, because sometimes you couldn't tell exactly what a person had done, except you knew what unit in the military or the police that the person had worked for then the historian would be able to say, well, this is what this unit did. So um, it was a very professional uh, operation. It was called the Office of Special Investigations. It had uh, superb people heading it and they did an amazing job. As I said, they brought cases against a hundred people. <laughs> These are cases in some cases that were 30 years old mass murder cases, the documents in a different language, the witnesses all over the world, but they were able to bring these cases. And they're very hard to bring too, because the standard, while it's not a criminal standard, these are civil cases, the standard is clear and convincing evidence to remove someone's citizenship. That's almost as tough as beyond a reasonable doubt. Very difficult standard to meet. You had to go through removing citizenship, but that was four courts through, if you took the appeals, and then you'd have to deport them, which is another, I'm sorry, the removal of citizenship was three stages and then deportation was another four stages. So it was seven stages. These people got due process when they gave new, no due process to anybody in Europe. Um, so it was amazing. Nobody believed that these cases could be won. They were won. And the important thing is they were won in various places in the country. There were Nazi war criminals found in Detroit, in the New York area, in Florida, in uh, the Midwest, in the South. Every community in which these cases were brought was an opportunity to educate the public in those areas. And the record was so strong in these cases that it, was, it, it gave um, lie to the deniers of the Holocaust. It showed the evil and the horrors that had happened. So these cases were also setting a very important record. Um, I guess the question now arises, I, when I was in Congress, 
I was always asking myself, how did this happen? How did these Nazis get here? Why did the government do nothing? But I felt that I didn't have the luxury of looking into that issue at that time. It was more important to bring the cases because the victims were dying, uh, those who were still alive, the witnesses were dying, and um, documents were perishable as well. So I thought the first imperative was to bring the Nazi war criminals to justice, and then we could do the history. And the history ultimately was done. There was a major, major declassification project. I was involved in drafting the legislation for it. Uh, now Governor DeWine from um, Ohio and Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney drafted the bill and it created a special um, entity in the government that was to monitor the declassification of all the government's files on Nazi war criminals that were still secret. And there were 8 million pages of documents that were still secret. And that project has been completed. The agencies, particularly the CIA, fought us tooth and nail. We were able nonetheless to override their objections. And the truth is out. And at least one book has been written about it, which shows the collaboration abroad after World War II with Nazi war criminals. And I think the best case to illustrate the mindset of the US government is a case of a guy called Klaus Barbie. Klaus Barbie was the butcher of Lyon. What's that mean? He was the head of the Gestapo in Lyon. And we know that at the very least he sent uh, Jewish children to Auschwitz. He was a very, very, very sadistic, evil person. And um, Klaus Barbie is the head of the Gestapo and the Nazis were losing the war. And he got together with a few Gestapo SS buddies of his and they sat around, they said, how are we gonna save our necks? We were worried that the Americans and the British and the French would just execute them for their war crimes. And they weren't far from wrong. So they said, what can we do? And they said, ah, here's our plan. We're going to go and tell the British and the French and the Americans that we were really anti-Russian. We weren't for Hitler. We were anti-communist. And maybe they will use us. Maybe somehow we can persuade them to use us because you know, where there's going to be a Cold War and Russia's on the other side. So maybe they'll use us. So Klaus Barbie and these and his companions went to the British first and then the Americans and told them that we really not <laughs> for Hitler, we're really anti-communist. And of course, that line was bought hook, line and sinker. And Klaus Barbie was put to work doing intelligence work for the American government. It's hard to know what Barbie had that was useful and how it would be even how, I mean, it was totally immoral to have this man working for us, particularly working in France where he had killed people. And what were we thinking when it was likely that the French government and the French people would find out, oh, here's Klaus Barbie. We've been looking for him all over France. Where is he now? We can prosecute him. So the US, well, that's what happened. The French found out that Klaus Barbie had inveigled the US government to hire him. And the US got wind of the French interest in prosecuting and executing Klaus Barbie. So the US government protected him. They snuck him out of Europe on something called the rat line, literally called the rat line, which was a special underground railroad, if you will, to sneak Nazi war criminals out of Europe to South America. So Klaus Barbie, thanks to the US government, which obstructed justice by shielding him from prosecution by the French, was, was um, sneaked out of Europe on the rat line, wound up in 
Latin America, in Bolivia, where he may well have been advising governments in torture techniques and the techniques he had used in the Gestapo. So we have a lot to account for with regard to Barbie, but ultimately the US government, as a result of the unit I created, the special, um, op, the special investigations unit, did a report on Klaus Barbie and uncovered not only that he was in Bolivia, but that the role of the US government in protecting him and the French asked for his uh, extradition from Bolivia, and he was ultimately taken to France and tried, prosecuted and convicted. But the role of the US government was terrible there. And it just shows you though, and he wasn't the only person that we allowed to get out of Europe on the rat line. And he isn't the only Nazi war criminal that we worked with, not just looked at, worked with, not just work with, protected, shielded from accountability and shielded from justice. What happened was the Cold War and we all of a sudden forgot entirely about the evils of Hitler, about the evils of Nazism, even though the victims still hadn't been counted even. Um, and that's what happened. Um, and there's another story that came out basically as a result of the declassification project that I was involved in that showed not just the immorality of using Nazi war criminals, but to me, this is an eye-opening story because it shows how counterproductive it was. Because these people, I, I, well, Klaus Barbie, what was he going to tell the United States that was going to be of any use about France? Really? Anyhow, I mean, he was a German. What was he going to tell about France? In any case, um, the, uh, the story I wanted to talk to you about, excuse me, <coughs> sorry, is about a man called Reinhard Galen. Now, Reinhard Galen, similarly, he was the head of the um, intelligence, excuse me, on the Eastern Front excuse me, I'm going to sneeze again, I think it's hay fever. He was in charge of intelligence for the Nazis on the Eastern Front. Well, what was happening on the Eastern Front? Two things were happening. The Russians were defeating the Germans. And the second thing that was happening is, of course, the Germans, the Nazis were killing the Jews, all the Jews that were left. I mean, there were more than a million and a half Jews, maybe more, undoubtedly more, um, in uh, territories of the former Soviet Union that the Nazis um, invaded. Anyway, we, Galen gave the same story. He said, listen, Americans, I, I'm really handy for you. I, I know a lot about Russia. I was chief of uh, army intelligence for the Nazis. Well, what did he know? The Nazis lost. What did he know? The Nazis were involved in mass murder, but we decided Galen was our guy. And we put him, we, the United States, we put him in charge of West Germany's uh, spy operation, their CIA. And of course, who is Galen going to hire? But the people he knew <clears throat> on the Eastern Front, people who were involved in the mass murder of Jews. And that's what he did. And nobody said boo, and no one stopped to think about it because this is, we, you know, the ends justify the means and we can do whatever we want. But, you know, people who have blood on their hands can be subject to blackmail. So the people in the Galen organization, his buddies who had killed Jews, killed dissidents, killed others, the Russians got to them and they said, hey, you know, we can expose you. So you give us your secrets. <laughs> they had the Russians penetrated Galen's organization because the Nazi war criminals he had hired were all subject to, not all, but they were all po potentially subject to blackmail. And the US government found that the number two person that Galen had hired was in fact giving the Russians all the secrets, which may have been a good thing because if the Russians knew exactly what was going on, maybe they wouldn't get as worried and maybe this prevented any war from happening between the US and Russia. It wasn't an intentional program, however, the US did not 
want to have the Russians know everything about Germany's spy operation. And not only that, but of course, since Germany knew about what we were doing, our secrets were also given to the Russians. So this is both the stupidity and the immorality of the US program with regard to Nazi war criminals after World War II. I won't go into detail about it, but a book that was written as a result of the declassification project we undertake, undertook was called U.S. Intelligence and the Nazis. And it goes into detail about the work that we did after the war and how we worked with Nazi groups to uh, plant and hide and conceal armaments in the event there was gonna be a war with Russia, but we used Nazis. I mean, the idea that we would use Nazis, that that would be trustworthy for us, that it was moral, that there weren't other people aside from Nazis to use. I mean, it, it's the thinking, the mindset is just incredible, horrifying. And as I mentioned, with regard to the Galen organization, it backfired. So I'm just going to leave you with a few thoughts about this whole story. We're at the point now where probably the last person, because of age, has been deported from the United States. He was reported, deported about three years ago. He was a concentration camp guard at uh, Treblinka, and he was deported to Germany. Uh, thank goodness. Um, but the story really is has many components. One is, and it's kind of surprising, but that's the good news, is that it took one person, me, I don't mean to be immodest, but that is, happens to be the truth, to turn things around. We had a quarter of a century of not only indifference, but of collaboration with Nazi war criminals, both in the US and outside the US. That's over. Not only that, but the US started a program to bring these people to justice. What was the message before that? allowing Nazi war criminals to stay in the U.S. send a message not just around the world about U.S. hypocrisy on human rights, because if you're for Nazis, you're not for any human rights. You're not for freedom. You're not for justice. You're not for humanity. So that was a terrible message that was being sent around the world, but also to American citizens about what our values were as a nation. But it showed that if one person, just one person stood up against this evil, it could be changed. I mean, the good news was in the end, Americans didn't like Nazis. It, it really turned out to be the case. So that is an encouraging fact, but Nazi war criminals didn't have a big constituency in the US Congress. And uh, we were able to, to change it, but didn't change by itself. It required real constant effort for over four years to turn the whole situation around. And then the um, other important thing is that sometimes you have to create a really important record because of the Holocaust deniers and those people who want to say uh, that it never happened. You know, it's a little bit like, oh, the insurrection, <laughs> which is tourists. <laughs> taking a good look at the House of Representatives and they wanted to see the speaker's desk up close or some kind of nonsense like that. So having a clear record of the horrors and telling the truth about that in an indisputable and irrefutable way is very important for preserving democracy. And that was done. The other thing that this program shows is that the US was too willing to adopt the idea that the ends justify the means. Yes, communism and Soviet, Soviet Union were presented a very, very bleak and terrifying picture. And there was a gulag in Russia. There was no freedom there either. But to use Nazis, that was insane. And actually, as I said, it was totally counterproductive. I didn't even give you some other examples of how counterproductive it was. I gave you the Galen example, but we sent uh, Nazis into Albania. Every one of them was arrested. Every one of them was picked up. 
Albanians weren't for Nazis. We sent Ukraine, we sent people into the Ukraine and to some of the other satellite countries in order to foment revolution there. Well, of course, the idea that you foment revolution uh, was, was insane to begin with, but, but put that, putting that aside, the idea that Nazis would be welcome <laughs> in the Ukraine, not really. The Ukrainians suffered terribly at the hands of the Nazis, and so did the other Slavic peoples. They were all viewed as undermentioned, under people, you know, not, not human, inhuman. So the idea that that would happen is just crazy. And then, of course, the other thing that we see that uh, taints and corrupts this is the secrecy. The secrets that the United States worked hand in glove with Nazi war criminals, both here and abroad, now the secrets were kept from the, for 30, 40, 50 years. The problem is that that was never a policy that the American people would have supported. They never would have supported working with Nazi war criminals. Americans died fighting the Nazis. They would not have supported this. And that's why the policy was kept secret. And so secrecy is a terrible, can be a terribly anti-democratic, anti-human rights kind of policy. The good news here is that finally, we were able to disclose all the secrets that we could find. The government did, Congress did. Our little monitoring group made sure of that. Not every country that harbored Nazi war criminals, and we weren't the only ones, the British did, the French also, Germans, we know a few countries did, the Russians too. They haven't disclosed their dirty laundry. We did, but we have to learn the lesson from that. That's the vital thing. We can't tolerate mass murderers. We can't tolerate bigotry on a governmental level and we can't keep secrets about it. The ends don't justify the means. That's the good news is that we can tell this story now and we learn from it is the other question. Really, Thank you very much. I mean, much. I think this is such a powerful uh, presentation and you have taught us so much tonight that I'm, uh, I don't have any questions to ask. Uh, I think that the real issue here is that we need to continue, as Liz says, to seek the truth, to study the past, to learn from our mistakes, and to move forward. And uh, I can't thank you enough for your lifetime of public service to American democracy and to the people of America and to fighting uh, Nazis and other forms of injustice. Well, thank you for saying that. I mean, that is the heartening thing is that we, we did learn in this case, we opened our files. We told the American people the ugly truth. That's not easy for a government to do. We can do that. And that's what we need to know. We can do that. And we're stronger as a democracy and the American people know what government has done. And some of the things that the government was doing was against what the American people would ever have wanted. I think there's no better way to end this with, than with that statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to your audience.